short guy. My name is Matt. I'm an addict. And uh, I am an ironic candidate for this workshop. So, you know, I think it's probably best that I tell you a couple things about me before you get any false expectations that I'm going to have some magic answers for you about relationships and how to maintain quality ones in your life. (laughs) I need to tell you that that this addict, uh, I've been clean for 21, actually 22 years, and... um, (laughs) Yeah, thanks for applauding, that's the good part. But here's the part where it gets real. Up until 2007, I have not had a romantic relationship in my life any time in that 20, uh, those 22 years that lasted more than six months. Okay. And six months was the record. I don't know why you're clapping for that. That's just sick. <laughs> um, and, and, and I'll tell you, that six-month relationship, that six-month intimate relationship was a record. And I remember it was in 1996 because it was my 10-year birthday, you know. And, and that was the exact day I ended it. You know, she came to my house with flowers and a chip. And I said, baby, this isn't working, you know, um, because it was starting to get personal. It was starting to get real, you know. Um, So I'm one of those addicts that uh, has successfully managed to avoid intimacy most of my recovery. You know, I am the probably the poster child, the textbook definition of fear of intimacy. Um, But I've managed to do a couple things correctly as a result of staying around here. You know, one of the things uh, that I do have working for me is that I have had the same sponsor for 21 years now, and. You know, that man, you know, has raised me and worked with me uh, when I'm very sure a few others of you would, you know, uh, and watched me. I got clean at 18 years old, and he watched me, you know, come into this program kind of an awkward, you know, unsure of himself, teenager, adolescent and literally grow up in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous. So everything I do know about intimacy, good or bad, I learned from you all. All Uh, So Narcotics Anonymous gets full full credit and blame, (laughs) at times in equal proportions. But I learned from others in these rooms. You know, when I came to Narcotics Anonymous, I certainly did not have any tools or skills for living life. You know, uh, and being close to people was not something I did. It just wasn't instinctive or intuitive to me. I was raised in a in a family where I did pretty much get to be myself and have fun right up until about five or six o'clock in the evening, and that's when Dad came home from work. And then it was time to make sure that at all costs I am not seen and I am not heard. And Consequently, as a result of that, you know, allowing myself to be close to people and certainly allowing myself to to actually develop relationships with men in this program was a real struggle for me and continues to be, you know. Um, Even my sponsor will tell you, yes, he's been my sponsor for 21 years, but it's been a, a constant kind of ebb and flow of me giving a little bit and then needing to step back and hide for a little bit, you know. I've done a lot of really searching and fearless inventories, I've done a lot of step work, uh, and then I've done a lot of like, uh, you know, hiding afterwards and taking a little bit of time off. So I'm one of those. What happened for me recently, and the reason I think I got set up for this workshop, was uh, I, I had met a girl I'd known, this, this kind of uh, attractive young woman in, in N.A. in Northern California, uh, and we'd kind of run into each other in a few places, and, you know, there's nothing like world conventions for the hookup. And <laughs> we met in San Antonio, 
you know, as far as officially kind of like hanging out and starting to talk to each other and uh, getting to know each other and, you know, close the deal a week afterwards. And, and the reason I knew the relationship was going to be perfect for this addict was because uh, we hooked up the night of our regional service committee meeting after we were finished at the RSC. And, uh, you know, it was a typical addict first date. We started by just like kind of hanging out, going to get some dinner, talking, and then all of a sudden, you know, hey, you know, it's really late. We should get a hotel room, you know. <laughs> and, you know, that's just kind of how that one went. But, but the miracle for me in that is that throughout my recovery, the romantic relationships I've been involved in have been about drama, excitement, that intensity, like chasing the next fix. You know, and that's the reason that like six months was my record because when it became personal, when it became real, was when I started to feel unsafe and had to end things quick. You know, I would always sabotage a relationship. I was always convinced that it's going to go south anyways. I might as well end it now, you know, before it gets too far down the road and I really get my feelings hurt. The miracle is is that, you know, we've been together almost two years now, and, and so for me that's a record. You know, it was 2007. <laughs> you know, and, and she's perfect for me in a lot of ways. I'm a service nut. She's a service nut, you know, so we get our little laptops and we run all around the region together and, you know, try and control everything together. And... Uh, <laughs> And we have a lot of fun, you know. Um, the one challenge I have, she has eight years clean, and she works a much better program than I do. So uh, I, I feel inferior a lot of ways at home. You know, she's got all these sponsees calling her, you know. I've got like half a sponsee, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I'm sure you guys have half a sponsee. It's, it's the guy, that, you know, the, 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 the man or woman that, that has your number and claims you to be their sponsor, but will just touch base with you once a, every great while and, and don't really do too much. Um, but, you know, hey, half a sponsee is more than I've had at other times around here, so I'm taking it for now. <laughs> to get that half a sponsee, he put me through a two-week interview process. <laughs> I mean, it was grueling. I mean, there were long phone calls. He asked me questions about every area of my life. I felt like I was going through some sort of federal background check. You know? <laughs> He made me drive out an hour to the area that he lives in and meet him for coffee and sit down with him and he grilled me about my spirituality and what are my practices, and, you know. I was worried. I started shaking and getting nervous and sweating even more than I am up here, you know. I really wanted to pass that test. So I guess I got a C because I got half a sponsee. Um, I, you know, I've learned so much through Narcotics Anonymous, and you know, and, and uh, I guess one of the things I need to say is is that I'm one of those addicts that probably learned the most about relationships and relationships with you all through doing service in this program. You know, uh, that thing in the basic text about learning to disagree without being disagreeable. You know, uh, I learned that by getting involved. You know, when I came to Narcotics Anonymous, I didn't have any skills. I, I essentially stopped going to school in the eighth grade. You know, the longest I'd ever held a job, I was a teenager and I got a job painting houses, the inside of houses, in the summertime. And, uh, you know, I showed up to work one day drunk on a bunch of cheap red wine and my boss asked me to go paint the inside of these closets and it's like 103 degrees in there. So, you know, I'd been on the job about a week, thought I was doing pretty good. He comes by to see how it's going and those paint fumes kick in and I turn around and I throw up warm red wine all over him, you know. <laughs> and that, I've got to tell you, that was my most successful employment experience prior to coming to Narcotics Anonymous. <laughs> so I didn't have very many life tools when I came in here, you know. Um, and I was one of those addicts, you know, uh, that when I first came around the rooms, I hung out in the periphery. You know, I was one of the court card people. I'd been through two different treatment centers. I'd been through a couple juvenile 
institutions, and I wasn't really sure I wanted this thing, and I kind of hung out in the back of the rooms, and I consequently, you know, after a little time around here, my first time around here, left and got loaded. And when I came back from my first relapse, it was really apparent that for this addict, you know, that because I'm so afraid of intimacy and because I don't let my guard down real easy and let you get to know me, that I need to put myself front and center in this program, you know, that I need to get an involved in service and be an active member of Narcotics Anonymous. I can't afford not to be. This is my life. So I have to participate here. And uh, I got involved in a home group, you know, back when we weren't even really sure what a home group was. Some, some woman from the East Coast moved over to our little area in Northern California and said, oh, you got to do it this way. This is how you have a home group. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know. Um, but I realized what a home group was, you know, and it was a place where I showed up every week and helped set things up and get involved. And, and here was the thing, you know, I started feeling woefully inadequate about doing this workshop, thinking, oh, I don't have tons of track record and history to share with you all about romantic relationships. But relationships is so much more than that. And the reality is, is if you stick around Narcotics Anonymous for any length of time, you're going to have relationships with the other people in this program. How good or bad they are is entirely contingent upon how hard I want to work at them. But I have relationships with the people in this program, you know. And uh, through getting a core home group, I started to allow people to get to know me. And I was one of those people, you know, that immediately took to service. And at, I was one of the, I was that guy. I was that guy that at two years clean was at regional service, you know, telling everybody what they were doing wrong. You know, and at three years clean, I went to my first world service conference because I wanted to let them know what I thought, you know, because um, I'm sure they weren't doing it right. And I, I had some good information. They just wouldn't let me share it. <laughs> but I tell you, you know, service teaches us those things about learning to disagree without being disagreeable and to work together and get to know each other. And it's amazing because, you know, at this convention, the amazing things that happen at world conventions. I mean, I loved the geographic countdown last night. I mean, that was so incredible, you know, and I love the speakers. I was so excited to see that Reggie was one of the speakers last night because I've heard him a couple times in Hollywood, and, you know, he's fantastic. All the speakers here have been great, but it's the little things that happen in the hallways of, of conventions that are so special. And, and the other night we were out to dinner, and, and I saw a woman that you know, got clean around the same time I did in my area back in 1986 and uh, had since moved away to Texas. And she hasn't seen me in years and years and years, you know. And we used to do service together on the little area activities committee, you know. And I know I was difficult back then, you know. You know, I was, you know, like 20 years old with two years clean, and I was a know-it-all, you know. And uh, the people on that activities committee loved me and let me be involved and let me participate and reminded me when I should shut up, you know. Uh, and she hadn't seen me since, you know. And the first thing she said is, wow, you've really grown up. You know, uh, <laughs> and I want to minimize that and say, well, yeah, maybe on the outside, not so much on the inside. But you know, I, I have grown up in this program, and, and and here's where I was going with this service thing, and this is why it's so important. I was a very closed-minded addict when I came into Narcotics Anonymous. I used in a small town. I got clean in a small town, and I had a lot of judgments and predispositions about other people. One of the things that happened when I started getting involved in service is I started going to the regional service meetings where people came from all over. And there was a person at the regional service meeting who I really admired his service. He did a lot of service work for Narcotics Anonymous. He was very active in public information, public relations. And I very much wanted to learn from him and follow him around. But this member was also very openly homosexual. And I was very openly homophobic. <laughs> and terrified. Because in my narrow mind, in my way of thinking, is I just assumed I was obviously irresistible to any gay man. <laughs> and I 
loved going around with him to all the conference agenda report workshops and region, and I even followed him down to the World Service Conference, and I really enjoyed learning from him and everything else, but when it became late, I became nervous, you know what I mean? <laughs> But I have to tell you something that, you know, I, I moved to San Francisco at about seven years clean, and I ended up moving and living in the gay neighborhood, and uh, it actually ended up being the nicest, cleanest neighborhood in San Francisco. Um, and him and I ended up doing service together. We did service together throughout. We did service together for many, many years. And he got sick with the AIDS virus, um, you know, as, as so many of our members have. And... We, you know, we're doing all this service together, and at this particular point, um, he was chair of the San Francisco area, and I was chair of our little service office, and we would sit up late at night together in the service office, you know, plotting and planning and reorganizing the service structure and our vision, and, uh, you know, and having these long, in-depth philosophical talks, and, and what I'm getting at is, is, is we got very close, and... It got to a point, and his name was Tony, and it got to a point where Tony got really sick and he had to go in the hospital for what was really apparently going to be the last time. And he called me and asked me to come down and, and see him in the hospital and to bring a pad and pen. And I thought, oh, cool, this is going to be another one of those things where we're going to rewrite area service and let everyone know how it's going to be. And he came down and he said... I need you to, um, I'm going to tell you what I want to say. I need you to write out my last chairperson's report for me. And he told me, um, you know, exactly what he wanted to say, his goodbyes to the fellowship, his goodbyes to the area service committee. Um, and I took that pad, and two days later he passed away. And I have to tell you, I've had some amazing experiences being in service in Narcotics Anonymous. I've gotten to go to a lot of places. I've got to do a lot of neat things and meet some fantastic people. But to this day, there is no bigger honor that I've ever had in Narcotics Anonymous other than being able to stand up at the area service meeting and read Tony L's final report to the fellowship because he was my friend for many years around here. And that was... So here's the thing I've realized about relationships. It's really just like everything else around here. It's nothing I can really control, you know, or maneuver, um, despite my best efforts. You know, uh, the, the speaker Thursday night, Earl. Earl is fantastic. If anyone heard Earl, Earl Thursday night, uh, I just met Earl at a service work group uh, about this time last year, and we were we didn't know each other at all, and we're all checking in this service meeting. And he starts sharing about himself. And he says, you know, I've always fancied myself a lone wolf, an independent. I like to do things my own way. I don't really hang out with a lot of people in the fellowship. You know, I, I, I tend to go off and just kind of, you know, be by myself. And then my sponsor told me that that's just another form of control, you know. And that hit me, like, right in the chest. Because up until that point, I was right there with them. It's like, yeah, man, I'm a lone wolf too. You know what I mean? I, I walk my own path, you know. Uh, it's another form of control, you know. I can do this kind of stuff real well, and I can come hug you guys at the convention and, and do all this drama and stuff, but I am not Mr. Follow-Through. You know, back home at my area, you know, I have a hard time having lasting and sustained relationships with people. And it's something I need to work on, and I'm telling on myself now, you know. One of the challenges I have is, is in my area in San Francisco, there's not a lot of people with a lot of clean time uh, that share similar beliefs or interests to myself. And, and I've had a real difficult time at this per current point in my recovery maintaining friendships. But I have a couple of good friends that have been good friends of mine for a very long time, and I, I guess that's, that's special in and of itself that I have two long-time N.A. friends. You know, one of them is my sponsor's son, and uh, he's been clean for quite a long time himself, and I was really looking forward to spending time with him at this convention, uh, but his you know, uh, business priorities made it so he couldn't be here. 
Um, but we bond over a lot of things. I mean, one, one of the most important is we get to make fun of our sponsor together, or my sponsor, his dad. And he always reminds me that he didn't have a choice, I did. Um, but we've also grown up together. You know, we've been crazy, stupid teenagers in this program, and we did a lot of acting out in our mid-20s. I mean, young guys clean in San Francisco. It's, you know, one of those places where if you want trouble, you can find it. Um, but we've also matured and grown up and been, been able to start having relationships in our lives, and, and, and that relationship's evolved and changed. Uh, the other thing that happened to me is, is, is several years ago, uh, almost 10 years ago now, uh, I met a woman in this program, and for the first time, it wasn't a sexual thing. I can assure you that when it started out, I wanted it to be, you know what I mean? But she was real clear with the boundaries that we were just going to be friends. And somehow I became okay with that. And as a result, I built an amazing friendship for many years with a woman in this program. And, uh, and it became non-sexual. It became where I began to look at her as like my sister. And this is really different for me, you know. And uh, I'll tell you, that relationship had the ultimate bond. This is a little world convention story. We went to the world convention in Cartagena, Colombia, uh, which was a fantastic convention. And we were there at the convention, and we were out jet skiing in the water. And she flew into a steel post that was sticking up out of the base, out of the water, uh, going full speed in her jet ski, and broke her leg with bones sticking out in two places. And here I am in the water in Colombia with my friend with compound fracture and bleeding and bone sticking out of her leg. And it's like, I'm in Colombia. What are we going to do now? You know, and an addict who I, I believe is here this weekend named Hamilton helped us, you know, came up on his jet ski. We got her on, on his, rode her in uh, to the resort hotel. The hotel, you know, couldn't get an ambulance. They couldn't find an ambulance. So finally we laid out a big, like, lawn, lawn chair and made that a stretcher and put her in the hotel van drove her to this little hospital in this little suburb called uh, Boca Grande uh, where they did not have any narcotics or anything to give her despite the tremendous pain she was in because obviously the hospitals aren't the ones that get the narcotics in Colombia. Um, so she had a very tough time. But the love and support of the fellowship came out. You know, the love of the f and support, because I was scared to death. I mean, Colombia, if you're an American, Colombia is not a good place to, to, to need serious medical care, you know. And, you know, the people from World Services were fantastic. They immediately arranged a first-class seat on a flight out for her so she could stick her leg up. Uh, Danny, who's here from Indonesia, uh, put up quite a bit of money to help cover her hospital bill so we could get her out of the country. And I don't know to this day if Danny's ever been paid back, but thank you, Danny. You know, the members, the members of this program stepped up. And I got to tell you, I thought I had a close relationship with this girl, you know, and a close friendship. But it went to a whole nother level on that 10 hour flight home because she was completely incapacitated. In fact, I had to check her out of the hospital two days before the flight because we were so worried about infection, the hospital was almost dirtier than where we ended up taking her in the hotel room. Um, and all they did was just kind of sew up her leg like a loose bag of broken bones so we could get her on the flight and get her back to medical care. And uh, she was completely immobilized, so I had to do bedpan duty. You know, I had to do the bedpans, and when it came to get on a nonstop flight, I had to do the diapers. And uh, that will really cement a friendship. You know. <laughs> Here's the thing, I said non-stop flight, that wasn't really correct. The, the flight had a stop in Bogota, and we were out of diapers. So while she was laid up, I had to go find uh, a Spanish-speaking uh, local member in Bogota, and we had to go out into the city and go to a little pharmacy and get diapers. And all I know, you know, I'm sure Bogota's fine, but I mean, I was scared to death. You know, and, and I'm holding these adult diapers and running through Bogota, and just this couldn't be any more surreal. 
she's a good friend, and I know she would love to be here. She was my convention buddy for many, many years, and then she had a convention hook up too, and her life changed. Uh, but we're still friends, and that's amazing to me. That's amazing that I have a long-term friendship, non-sexual, with a woman in this program. You know, so I've learned a couple things about relationships. And here's another last thing, because I'm kind of running out of time, but it, and it's kind of a cool convention story, and it's, it's some relationship stuff, too. When, when I was about four and a half almost years queen, the word came down that the World Convention Narcotics Anonymous was going to be in Sydney, Australia. I really wanted to go to Sydney, Australia. I was one of those addicts that used a lot of speed and methamphetamine and consequently was very paranoid and so I never left a very small area of my neighborhood. In fact, the second time I got taken to a treatment center, I got taken to a treatment center about 18 miles from home and I AWOLed, I ran out, I turned around and went back because I realized I didn't know how to find my way home. Um, so I got excited, and my friends got excited. We started saving up to go, go to this world convention in Sydney. As the convention got nearer, we ran out of, a lot of my friends ran out of money, and as a result, they couldn't go. So here I am. I get on this plane by myself with no real friends, no advance reservations, no hotel, anything else. Jump in this little plane, you know, squished in coach, and fly 14 hours nonstop straight into Sydney, get off the plane, get a cab, and get dropped off in King's Cross. So here I am sitting in King's Cross with my luggage, no idea where to go, and it's about a week and a half before the convention starts. I figure I better get to a meeting. I pick up a phone. I'm trying to figure out how to dial the 011. I can't, you know, it's taken me forever. I get an operator on the line, ask for Narcotics Anonymous. They put me through to the NA helpline. The NA helpline says, oh, yeah, there's a little meeting around the corner and up the stairs from you. If you can hurry, you can make it. So, you know, I grab my luggage and I scoot up and I find this little building, get up there. I sit down in this small meeting. It's all men. That should have been my first cue. Um, and I meet, it's only like eight or nine local guys, maybe ten. One of them I recognized and knew. And I met him briefly at the World Service Conference. And... The trick was he was there with a bunch of like treatment clients. They were like his treatment clients that were in the meeting. And uh, after the meeting was over, they all got into that treatment van, you know, the funny little treatment vans. And they threw my luggage in the van and threw me in the van like I was in treatment too. <laughs> but what they did is they looked after me. They made sure that for my entire stay in Australia, I had a place to stay. You know, I had a home. You know, I got to see the sights, I was fed, I had fellowship. And it reminded me, it drove home for me again, that wherever I go worldwide in Narcotics Anonymous, I am home. I am with family. I'm in my final minute, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with this. As if that experience wasn't profound enough, you know, I turned five years clean and it was my first experience of being at a really international world convention and I'm so blessed. I missed Paris. London was just before I got clean, but I, I was in Colombia and I'm so grateful to be here because this is the best one yet. You know, it's so amazing, the diversity of our fellowship and how much we've grown. I came back from that convention and, 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 and it was coming up on my five years clean and it was also the five year anniversary of another fairly traumatic experience for me. When I first got clean, uh, I went through a treatment center and I got very close. I was, I was 18. I got very close to a 16 year old girl named Tabitha. And she was very much like my sister and my friend and we had all that high treatment drama of we're going to stay clean forever and go to a million meetings and it's going to be so great. And uh, I got really close to Tabitha. We got out of treatment um, and I was supposed to meet her in the town of Sonoma and at a Friday night meeting. She did not show up for that meeting. And I waited for her that, for that meeting all night and she didn't come. The following morning, I was woken up uh, and, and told that she was killed in a car accident on her way to the meeting. And 
here I was with like 90 days clean about and as one of the hardest things I ever had to do in my life is I had to put on a suit and be a pallbearer at her funeral and she was 16 years old and just starting out in this program and I was still trying to figure out this God thing for myself something I still struggle with from time to time by the way and I was so angry and so confused about why would a loving higher power take someone like this or why let something this this horrible happen but you know a lot of times in this program I question you know I challenge but I still show up you guys have taught me to show up so I showed up for her funeral I put on this suit and I helped put her casket in the ground her 11 year old younger sister Heidi was there crying you know asking me the same questions for which I had no answers my sister Tabitha has tried so hard to get this program and she was so looking forward to this new way of life and she was so excited about this. Why? Why would this happen? Why would God allow this to happen? And I had no answers for Heidi. I came back from that world convention in Sydney, Australia and it was the fifth anniversary of Tabitha's passing and I remembered that. You know, for as much elation as I felt about the convention, I felt that sadness that Tabitha didn't get to experience that. And I was sharing about that in a meeting. And this 16-year-old girl comes up to me after the meeting with tears in her eyes holding a 90-day key tag. And she says, you probably don't remember me, but my name's Heidi. And I am so glad that you stayed around Narcotics Anonymous. You stayed in the rooms because I feel like there is a part of my sister that is here for me and that was waiting for me. So never discount the relationships that we have with each other in these rooms. When we think about relationships, we all know where our mind goes and we all want to talk about or focus on that one. But the reality is, is every person we hug at this convention, every person we may pass by because we're in too much of a hurry to stop and hug or say, how are you doing, or help them find their way on La Rambla or whatever, may be somebody that five years down the road, ten years down the road, reaches out and touches another addict because of the experience you shared with them in just a brief moment. And that's the power and the magic of, of this fellowship and this program of Narcotics Anonymous. Thank you. Woo!